Lord have to, has to get to this place in his life where Paul makes that statement in Galatians 1 about, uh, but though, in verse 8, but though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And when Paul says we, he's talking about him because <laughs> there's Paul's gospel, my gospel he talks about. And then he says, as we said before, so say, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Verse 10 is the verse. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now you've got to decide who you're going to serve in life. And the only way to serve Christ is to know what God said, not, not go around and tell people God's word is lost, and uh, we don't know really what God said, and uh, so forth. So anyhow, that's... It's a real shame what they've done to him. Religion does that, and they, and they do it by intimidation. They certainly didn't edify him into that. And uh, so you remember him in prayer, and, and if he's watching, and I hope you're rebuked by that, and, <laughs> and, uh, and think twice, not so much rebuked, but uh, I told him, as a, as a more of a spiritual father last week, I, I, I felt bad for him and, and where he's gone. And, and I realized, but I, I got the answer to my question is, how in the world does a young man come in this way and then end up where he's at now? And just by talking to him, I, even one of the things I said to him, like, you get rid of dispensational truth, something so obvious in the Bible is Jesus Christ comes back and he reigns a thousand years. Satan is locked in the bottomless pit a thousand years. Then the Bible says, when the thousand years is finished, he's going to be let out of, his, out of the pit, and he's going to deceive the nations one more time, and then God's going to put him in the lake of fire. So it mentions uh, like six times the thousand year reign of Christ. So I, so I said to him, I said, so you probably don't believe anymore in the literal millennium, a thousand year reign of Christ. And immediately, no, that's just a spiritual number. Because see, they don't believe in a thousand year reign of Christ. They don't believe anything dispensational at all. And uh, that, you know, ultimately we're in the kingdom today and the world just ends and Christ comes back. And they don't take the Bible literally at all. And so, anyhow, that... That's where he was, and that's how he got that way. Now, 2 Corinthians, you'll see when we study this, that fits into our Bible study. Because, you know, it, 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 in, our, in our church, we're established. A, a girl come in, a salesperson today, thought it was Sharita. <laughs> I'm Sharita. <laughs> it wasn't Sharita. So Sharita used to come here years ago. <laughs> anyhow, she says, who do you think I am? <laughs> so anyhow, but she was impressed with our books and all and asked some questions. And I showed her the right division chart and gave her some literature. And, and uh, I was explaining to her who the Apostle Paul is because apparently she goes to church somewhere. She says, oh, we should have this in our church. And, but I wanted to focus in uh, that what makes us different from all the other churches is we realize that God used the Apostle Paul to usher in the dispensation of grace, to interrupt what he was doing with Israel from what he's going to do with Israel in the future, and he's doing something different today in the dispensation of grace. And so I was explaining that to her and then explained to her that the books that she sees are books that you can't get in the bookstore because they teach his truth and they don't carry those books, and, but that's what our church is about. Well, not only is it what our church is about, it's what all of Paul's epistles are about, and it's, about, it's all of what the Apostle Paul is about. His calling and his commissioning has to do with what God's accomplishing today that wasn't made known before, but it's now revealed, and that it's an interruption in Israel's program to form the body of Christ. And, and, and the reason I say that is when you come to 2 Corinthians, you're going to see that in 2 Corinthians, there's a personal attack on the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm a little bit further into what I wanted to, to do, but you're going to see as we, as we kind of just do an overview of the whole book today that, that what 2 Corinthians is about is, is we saw Paul defending his apostleship in 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians there's a direct attack against him. And when you, when you attack Paul, you're actually attacking the doctrine for today. And, uh, and, and so, that's, so that, that's something that's woven all through 2 Corinthians, which is really important for you to see. And, and if you don't ever make something of Paul in the first place, they all, you know, people say, oh, you make too much of Paul. The Jews, did they make too much of Moses? <laughs> you know, you can't make too much of the person that God used. Now, you do if you worship the man. But we don't worship the man. We worship the, the message. We worship the God, the Christ, uh, that the Apostle Paul made known to us Gentiles and the gospel that's made known to us Gentiles. But we appreciate the messenger who brought it. 
and realized that he was a unique messenger for us Gentiles. Paul said in Romans that he is the apostle of the Gentiles. So anyhow, we don't make too much of him as a man, but we do make much of his ministry, or as Paul said, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. It's the office that's magnified. And, and so we do that, but most churches don't magnify it at all, don't recognize it at all, so they can't even, they, they wouldn't even be able to see the theme that runs through 2 Corinthians because that's what's in jeopardy of 2 Corinthians, someone not recognizing that. And you'll see as we, as we look through this. So let's get started. We're, we, we're, we're actually doing, after we've studied the book of Acts and saw the transition from Israel to the age of grace, the twelve apostles to Paul, and now we're looking at Paul's epistles and we're just doing an overview of each of his epistles, calling it after Acts. So look at the first 14 verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, uh, with all the saints which are uh, in all of Achaia. Um, if I had a Bible map here, often when I'm talking to you, I'll always talk to you about Macedonia and Achaia. When you get over in chapter 8, he's going to remind the Corinthians about the Macedonians. Well, Macedonia is the whole territory where Thessalonica, where Philippi is, that's all north of, of the area that, you know, if you're familiar with the map, where Greece is. Corinth is just outside Athens, Greece, or outside of Greece. But it's, they're in the bottom part of that peninsula, and that bottom part is called Achaia. So you see how he's addressing the church at Corinth with all the saints which are in all of Achaia. So that, that whole bottom, bottom section there. It says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so also the consolation, uh, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering which ye also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the suffer as you are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of all of our troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch as that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. Now I'm going to stop there. I want to read down to verse 14. But when he says, reminds them, and so they're not ignorant of the trouble he had in Asia, if you remember our study in Acts, and if you haven't been there, you, what you need to do is Acts chapter 19, right around verse 10, is when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. He was in Asia, in Ephesus. And, and he writes to them and prepares them for his next ministry. He's going to eventually come to them because he's going to take up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. So he writes to them and prepares them, but he said he's going to remain in, in, in Ephesus for a season, for another year. During that next year, there's a riot in the city of Ephesus because there have become believers in Jesus Christ and the people who made shrines for the goddess Diana were losing money. So all the men who built the shrine started crying, you know, great is Diana of the Ephesians and got all the people in an uproar and, and accused Paul of being against their goddess. Got, they all assembled in the auditorium or in an amphitheater there and, the, and then Paul wanted to go in and, and they wouldn't let him, even the deputy of the area, don't you go in there because these people are all in a frenzy and if Paul would have walked in they would have killed him. So there was a great riot that took place. And so when Paul starts talking about that in verse 8 there, for we, were, for we would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much we despaired even of life. <laughs> he, he was ready to die. He was going to go in there and witness to these people that are crying out, great is the goddess of Diana. Uh, of the Ephesians, uh, verse 9 says, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, 
that we should not trust in ourselves but in God that raises the dead. I'll just go in there and die and then God will raise me from the dead when the rapture takes place. So Paul reminds them of all the stress that he was under. Uh, who delivered us from so great a death, he ended up not dying. And doth deliver. He's still being delivered because he's on his way to Jerusalem, but there's more problems when he gets there. And, and we trust that he will yet deliver us. Uh, we also, helping together by, uh, ye also, helping together by prayer for us. When I was praying a few moments ago, we don't know exactly. How did Paul, they, were, they helped Paul by praying for him. How did that work out? Well, he... He was delivered. He's still being delivered. He hopes he's still being delivered. And, and he's telling them that your prayers are helpful. Now, in, in what way, whether it's encouragement for Paul, uh, whether there's other ways that God is working, I, I don't have the full answer to that. I just, I just recognize that prayer uh, and, and realize that we pray for things that not always knowing how the answer is going to be made or brought about. We also helping together by prayer for us, ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for, uh, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanksgiving may be made on, on, on our behalf. Uh, and that is Paul's taking that money to Jerusalem and that he's praying there that the saints at Jerusalem are going to rejoice about Paul and his ministry to the Gentiles. It says, for your rejoicing is this, our rejoicing is this, that, that the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we had our conversation, that's our life, in the world, and more abundantly toward you. For we write none other things unto you than that ye read, or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that ye are our, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now there's several things there that I'll bring your attention back to, but when you start, when we started that, as soon as you get to verse four, uh, well, verse three, blessed be the God and Father, uh, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are uh, troubled by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And, and then he goes on to talk about our consolation and them being consoled and God being involved in all of that. So as soon as you read the book, you, you, when you immediately see there's comfort, there's consolation, you see there's suffering, and you see there's encouragement. And so when you look at 2 Corinthians, the first thought is, in fact, look, at the, look how a book ends. The best doxology <laughs> in the Bible, at least the one for us in the age of grace. Everyone likes to quote uh, the doxology that's in, in Jude, but here's the doxology for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So, you, you, you know, you begin with this, you know, comfort, consolation, the, 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 the truth of the, the understanding they're suffering, but there's encouragement in it. And then you're left with a verse like that. And, and so you see that there's, and, and you might know some other verses, I'll show you in a moment, uh, that of, of all the sufferings, uh, the, the, that Corinthians talks about suffering and, and shows us some encouragement. I'm going to show you in a minute, that's not really all that there is in Corinthians. I, I just, I think most people think that's the theme of Corinthians because you see that suffering. Let me point out some others. Look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. I'm just going to jump through the book doing this. Verse 12. It says, Furthermore, when I came into Troas to preach Christ's gospel, the door, a door was open unto me, uh, open unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brethren, but taking, uh, uh, taking my leave of them, I went from thence, thence into Macedonia. So you see that Paul's you know, going through some suffering here, and, uh, and even though he had an open door at Troas, he, he didn't stay there. Uh, come over, uh, well, verse 14, uh, verse 14 says, Now thanks be to God, which, is all, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So, again, you see the encouragement. Come over to chapter 4. In verse 8. It says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. 
We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are uh, uh, persecuted, didn't say, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing in, about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our bodies. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And, and again, you realize Paul is, when he says all this, these are actual, his, his life is always in jeopardy. He's always going through troubles, but he always makes it out. He's distressed, but not, uh, uh, he's troubled on every side, but not distressed. He's perplexed, but not in despair. It just waits, and there's a deliverance, but, it, but he's always pending death there. And, and so he's talking about the suffering. In verse 16 it says, uh, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but, but the things which are not seen. Uh, for the things which are are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So he's always, he, he's looking for the eternal things and, and the, the outward man is perishing all the time and he talks about light afflictions working for him. If you go down to chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. So, if you remember the passage we studied on Sunday, when he says absent from the body, again, he's talking about death. He's willing to die and to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, so that whether he's present or absent, whether he's here serving the Lord or he dies and he's with the Lord, he may be accepted. And that is his ministry to the Lord would be accepted. We're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account someday. And so he labors and he's willing, rather, he's willing to die for the ministry. Come over to chapter 6. In verse 4, it says, But in all things, and this is talking about his ministry, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience and afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in watching, in fasting, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by, by the Holy Ghost, by the love of God, uh, by the love unfeigned, uh, by, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness uh, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as, deceiver, as deceivers yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying and yet behold we live, as chastened but not killed and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. You just see the, the extent of his ministry and the things that he goes through in the ministry. And so it, the life of ministry is a life of suffering. And it's not just, we live in the long suffering of God. That's why it's practical for everybody. And realizing that there is consolation in all this and there's hope. We've got to look at the things that are not seen, the things that are eternal, and, and endure through those things. And, and they work for us a far more eternal weight of glory. Uh, chapter 11. verse 24. He starts listing some of the things he suffered. He says, Of the Jews five times I received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I spent uh, in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers. You don't think about all that. Uh, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in, in the city, in perils in the wilderness. <laughs> You're not safe wherever you go. In perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, and fasting often, in cold and in nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. <laughs> well, it is a book about suffering, isn't it? <laughs> and consolation and all those things. He, he, he just keeps listing these things. One more yet. Come over to chapter 12 and verse 7. He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. 
For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And now right in the middle of that verse, Paul, his response to God's answer. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproach, in necessity, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Because in our weakness, Christ's strength then takes over. And we, he, all that he's been through, he's still there. He's been delivered. He's being delivered. Has, has faith he'll be yet delivered until God decides that, okay, Paul's ministry is over. So, so when anyhow, when you, you see all this verses about suffering uh, in 2 Corinthians, you realize, wow, it's, it's a book about being consoled, about, about consolation, about suffering, and about encouragement. Uh, but there's something else that you need to see. And, and while all of that is true, it, it was very, this, this consolation, this comfort that Paul's talking about, it was very needful for Paul personally. Uh, that, that what Paul is going through himself, that what he's expressing, like when you read again, and I'm not going to read it now, but again it, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, when he talks about we, well, look again at verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4. When he says, the God of all mercies, and then verse 4 says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to be be, uh, be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we ourselves are comforted of God. At, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. See, what Paul's talking about suffering and, and then how he can now help others understand they're going to suffer and how God works in suffering and how that suffering works for us and become encouragement to you. Paul's suffering. There, the, not just edifying you about suffering, he himself is going through a real hard time. That's why he told him in verse 8 about don't be ignorant of the trouble that we went through. And, uh, and so he is suffering things. And keep in mind that Paul had just recently wrote 1 Corinthians. Now we've studied 1 Corinthians. When he wrote 1 Corinthians, he started out defending, you know, they didn't know they were glorying in men. But he had to point them out that he is that they should think of him as the stewards of the mysteries of God, that he himself as an apostle has every right to lead someone about, but he wouldn't take any money for, for ministering to the Corinthians because of their carnality, but that he is the apostle to the Gentiles, it was that, that God is a wise master builder, he hath laid the foundation. He said, Though you had ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet I have begotten you through the gospel. Reminding them who he is, that he's the apostle of Gentiles that brought the salvation message to the Gentiles and that they should follow him because he's got God's message for the Gentiles. So, so he had to defend his apostleship. He, he had to then turn around and reprove them for all their carnality. Then he had to set in order all the things that were lacking in the assembly there and defend the faith. And then finally he had to encourage them to participate in this collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem and at the same time refusing to take any money from them for the gospel's sake. Uh, look at chapter 7. Now if you remember he just wrote all that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Breaking at verse 5. It says, For when we were come into Macedonia, and we already read there, that when he, he was at Macedonia, or when he was at Troas, there was a door effectual, but he went into Macedonia. Here he's telling them, For when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, without fightings, within fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he, he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, and so that I rejoiced the more. So he's over there. Remember, he's Macedonia's to the north, Achaia's to the south. He, over there, he's in the north, and Titus comes from, from Corinth and tells Paul, hey, the, the Corinthians are mindful of you. And Paul said, wow, God comforts me. <laughs> 
See, there was a struggle going on. What I want you to see is when he says there's fightings without and fears within, there's not only all the robbers and all the sufferings that go on, but there's spiritual battle and an attack against the Apostle Paul. And what's happening in 1 Corinthians is there, there is the response to the first letter, he's rebuked. And there's a whole group of people that took all that rebuke and say, look at that Apostle Paul. This guy, he thinks he's something. He's taken too much authority upon himself. Look how he's talking to you. Who does he think he is? And they're running down the Apostle Paul. And the Corinthians are listening to, and some of them are being persuaded by these people that are, are already running down Paul, not recognizing who he is as an apostle and what his words are not his words but the words of Christ and and so you know if you turn away from Paul you turn away from God's message you turn away from God's message all of Paul's ministry is useless so when he talks about those fears within now they could be like some fears you know just those natural fears uh, but there's also when he says the care of all the churches you know ultimately what happens uh, maybe you do second Timothy all those in Asia be turned from me that, that's when you go into the dark ages. Well, there, there's, a, there's a people that are doing a personal attack against the Apostle Paul, and, and, and there is some success. And, and Paul writes to the Corinthians to, uh, among the suffering that he himself is personally suffering heartache over this and, and causing him a lot of stress, but he's comforted by some of the positive things. First, let me show you the positive. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2 uh, verse 4. See, if, see if, this, if you can recall some of this. Uh, by the way, some people think verse 4 is about a different letter that's lost between 1 and 2. Um, I, I, if someone didn't point that out, I would have never thought so. I thought verse 4 is talking about 1 Corinthians. It says, for, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundant, abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which is inflicted of many, so that the contrary you ought to rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps, uh, uh, lest perhaps uh, should one should be swallowed up with, much, uh, with over much sorrow. Now, when he says sufficient to, to such a man is the punishment which is inflicted of many, and then he refers that I wrote to you. To me, that's 1 Corinthians chapter, one, uh, chapter 5, where the man was living in adultery, and they said, deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh. And, and now he says the punishment's been sufficient, and, and unless he be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow, it's time now to receive him, forgive him. Verse 8 it says, for, uh, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, for to this end did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For, for if I forgive anything to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. I'm not going to take you back to 1 Corinthians. Remember what he said about judging that man? He says, as if I was present with you, I've already judged this man in the name of Jesus Christ. Do this. Now he's saying, you forgive him, I forgive him in the name of Christ. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what he said before because now the, afflict, the punishment was afflicted, it was sufficient, the man put away his sin, and now it's time to forgive the man and bring him back. So, so there is some positive, as you read 2 Corinthians, uh, of, of positive results from the first, from the first epistle. Uh, look at verse 11. He, says, he said to do all this, lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now notice the devices there, it's plural. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan, in this case, has two devices. First Corinthians, look, look again, it says in uh, verse 9. Now watch, remember Paul wrote in First Corinthians 1, chapter 5, 
to deliver such a one unto Satan. Why did he do that? He didn't like that man. He says, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. It wasn't just for the man's sake. He's writing to the congregation. They weren't doing anything about it. And he wrote to them what they should do, and he wanted to see if they're going to be obedient. It was a test of the whole congregation, not just, not just the dealing with that one man. But then, so, so when it says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, Satan's device is first a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You let leaven in, you don't, you don't take the leaven out, you, don't, you let, you let Im immorality just come in and accept a, make it an accepted part of the assembly, then that's Satan's device to destroy the testimony of the church. So you'll be obedient, there is times you separate. But then when there's repentance, do you have the love and the forgiveness to receive the person back? Because Satan's device is that you be legalistic, hard-nosed, cruel, and say, no, we're never going to receive you back about it. No forgiveness for you. And Satan divide you that way. So infiltration, and then the times when you're supposed to be forgiven. Infiltration, that's the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, infiltration come in. And, other, and then other times when things are dealt with and, and the separation takes place, it's time to receive a person back to forgive. That's the other device of being unforgiving when you should be forgiving. And so uh, Paul says, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, and that's what he's referring to. Come on back to chapter 7 again. I think I deliberately stopped reading at this point. Verse 11, it says, For behold, for this selfsame thing, that, uh, for behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrow after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what uh, revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And he's talking about that first letter again, how he made him sorry in verse 10, but he's not sorry that he did and so forth. Verse 12 says, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause, his ca yeah, his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that, that, that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. I did this so that you would realize that we care for you, and, and, uh, and therefore we, were, we are, were comforted in your comfort, yea, we, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. So he did it for their sakes. And then remember how he told them at the end of chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, now it's time for you to start preparing to be a part of that collection. Well, just, I'm just going to point out to you, chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, we want you to know about the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded toward the riches of their liberality. For, beyond, for to their power I bear record, yea, beyond their power they were willing of themselves praying with us uh, praying with much ent entry that we might receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. The longest teaching about giving in the New Testament and, and the only teaching in the New Testament about grace giving is 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Now there's other inferences about it. But there's a whole lengthy teaching here about giving and he's using the Macedonians as an example because Paul's in Macedonia on his way down to Achaia. And uh, so he says, now these people really gave, look at chapter 9, verse 1, for as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous <laughs> for me to write unto you. And, and, and these are verses about giving again, where the Apostle Paul is <coughs> continuing some of the things from 1 Corinthians. Now, that's the positive, the result of 1 Corinthians and the effect of 1 Corinthians. But let me show you the negative. Go back now to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, we already got introduced to some of the sufferings and all, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, For we, we write none other things unto you than that which ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us, now notice that phrase, in part. There's the key to 2 Corinthians. 
There is some good, some people, some th they, they did some obedience to 1 Corinthians, they got some things set in order, but he says that, that they need, that when he writes, I mean, if he's writing, he said in 1 Corinthians, let many, if any man be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write unto you, the commandments of the Lord. These are not Paul's words, these are God's words. These are God's words to us Gentiles. So in verse 13 he says, For we write none other things unto you than, that, than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. You read Paul's epistles and acknowledge, okay, this is God's word to me. Even also as ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> That's the rapture there. You only acknowledge Paul in part, there's a problem. Now watch what happens here. He says, For in this confidence was I mindful to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit, and, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and come again out of Macedonia to you, and, and, to be, and, and of you to be brought on my way uh, toward Judea. So when he's doing this collection, he was actually going to go into the south, into Achaia, visit them, go into Macedonia, get the collection, come back to Corinth, and then they were going to send him to Jerusalem. But he changed his plans. Look, look at verse, uh, uh, verse 30, 23. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not yet to Corinth. Not that that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. So he changed his plans. Well, when he changed his plans and didn't come to them first, but he went to Macedonia first, and he's actually going to go down to Achaia and go back to Macedonia, they're going to get two visits, the people in Achaia only get one. There's people saying here, Paul's a liar. You can't trust this man's word. They're only they're acknowledging Paul in part. They're not really sure about Paul and what he writes. And just because he had a change of plan, well, that change of plan is personal planning. So look back up in verse 17. He says, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? Or the thing that I purposed, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? So Paul, he's just human. He's making a plans and sometimes human plans change. He says, but as God is true, our word toward you is not yea and nay, for the, Lord, for, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him is yea. <laughs> it's not, I'm not wavering. When I'm telling you what God said, there's no wavering back to forth. It's, the, it's yea, it's what God said. But see, they're accusing, you can read in the lines here, there's people saying, you can't trust this guy's word. You can't trust this man. And, and Paul's now having to deal with, with the, the Corinthians being tempted to, see, to, to, to turn away from him. And, and so those are the things that, that you begin to see that Paul is facing here at, at, uh, as he writes 2 Corinthians. Um, look at chapter 2 and verse 17. He said, when, now you'll realize why this says this. For we are not as many which corrupt the word, but as in, sincer, as in sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Why do you have to say that? We had to say that because some people are saying he's not sincere, he's not speaking in Christ, he, uh, he corrupts the word of God. He's got a whole revelation of mystery that's different than what was preached by other apostles, and so they're questioning the Apostle Paul and, and scaring the Corinthians to think this man is not speaking the Word of God correctly. So he has to put those things in there. Um, come over to chapter 6. Now, by the way, next week we'll go through my list. I list 13 things that they're accusing the Apostle Paul of that becomes clear as you go through 2 Corinthians. So it's, it's important to see this as a theme that's running through here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 11, he says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us. Now, you know, straightened means, like, narrow is the way. <laughs> straightened, it, when his heart's enlarged, he says, it's not narrow, it's not straightened. 
Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense, for a payback in the same, I speak you as my children, be ye also enlarged. In other words, Paul's saying, my heart's wide open for you. It's not narrow, but your heart is narrow. Now for a recompense, open up your heart. They're squeezing Paul out. <laughs> and, uh, and so they're, 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 this is, it, it's, it's doctrinally important, but it's also personal to Paul and, and emotional to Paul as he writes this. Um, look at chapter 7, verse 2. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. So you can actually think, what are people saying about him? Well, see, he's defending himself. They're saying all these things against him. And, and he says, receive us. Come over to chapter 12. This is, when I think of 2 Corinthians, this is the verse I think of all the time. He says in verse 15, he says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So you see there is a personal attack against the Apostle Paul. And, and, and that's when he talked about the fightings within and the fears, or the fightings without and the fears within, uh, that these Corinthians are being persuaded. That, that's why it, it, maybe this will, if you just back over to chapter uh, 11, that you'll understand why he makes this statement. He says in chapter 11, verse 1, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Now it's, not just, it's, not just a per, it's not just human jealousy, but godly jealousy. For I have espoused you unto one husband. Paul's the one who brought the Corinthians into a relationship to Jesus Christ and made us one with Christ. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which, we have not received, uh, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. See, there's someone else influencing the Corinthians that he labels in verse 13, such are false apostles, <laughs> deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So it's real clear what Paul's dealing with here at Corinthians is people running him down, saying about 13 different things against him, and the sufferings that he's talking about here and, and the consolation that he's receiving is not just the physical sufferings of going out in the ministry, it's, those, it's the sufferings of pouring your life into some people and they start doubting you and thinking contrary about you and falling under the influence of someone else when you're trying to just give them the truth of God's word and Paul is an apostle his words are the words of Christ for us Gentiles to turn from him would then be to be uh, uh, was that statement about Satan beguiled <laughs> as Satan beguiled Eve so your minds would be uh, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ so that's a little bit of an introduction to what 2 Corinthians is about. There's actually a word, uh, it, we're, it's too late for me to go over it, but if you read, uh, I didn't ask you at the beginning, when I asked you before we studied 1 Corinthians, how many people read 1 Corinthians? Don't answer me, because I'm, gonna ask, I'm not going to ask you, I'm just going to ask the question without an answer. Did you read 2 Corinthians before today? If not, you got enough introduction, you need to read, read 2 Corinthians before next week. When you do, watch the word commend and commendeth. Watch where they are, just link, if you find them, write them all down and link them together and they'll tell a story. And that's where we'll start next week. You'll have, you'll have my outline that begins next week together right there. So 2 Corinthians is really important because it's about the beginnings of not recognizing who the Apostle Paul is and where his message came from. Do you know what 2 Corinthians 12 is about? Around here it's one of the most popular passages. Paul caught up in the third heaven, received abundance of revelations. Why is he saying that? Because some people say he corrupts God's word. <laughs> He's explaining where, his word, where the word he teaches comes from. He, he was caught up into the third heavens. You see why all those verses connect. 
and uh, we'll connect them again next week. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for an opportunity to look at a whole book at one time like this so that sometimes we don't connect the verses and see all the sufferings, but the, the personal suffering that the Apostle Paul is experiencing, even emotionally, uh, but certainly as, a, uh, as an apostle who laid the foundation of grace for the Gentiles and, as he said, espoused us to Christ and then for others to come along and, and to draw people away from, from the message and the messenger uh, that was delivered to us. Father, what a danger that is and a heartache it was for the Apostle Paul to see happen. And may we stand fast in the faith, appreciating the revelation of truth and, and where it came from and where our doctrine is found. So thank you for our study today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.